Yeah. I'm like, I'm like 25 years old. I'm making good money trying to figure out my life after basketball, but I'm not happy. So I started to do like a little bit of training stuff and Kyle calls me and he goes, I got, I, I got a budget. Uh, you want to be my assistant coach? I quit my job. I come work for $2,000 a month. <laughs> minor, minor league pro basketball. <laughs> I show up. I have no idea what the hell I'm doing. Like no idea. I literally have been working with 13 year old girls and, uh, I show up and it's like, we got this team that is like an at work we, ringers, man, like ringers, like KJ stacked the deck with the squad. We had Royce white, like Royce was like the 16th overall pick in the NBA draft. And then like all that stuff happened with mental health, and whatever. Anyways, one of the first days, so I don't even know how to cut film. I don't know. I just remember from back in the day, but I'm using iMovie and I'm like trying to be as prepared as possible. So the first day that we're going to watch film and I'm like the same age as these guys. So I show up, I put this thing up, but I have this, we had the shitty little projector. And I've like stayed up all night cutting this film. Do you remember this call? I think so. <laughs> and, and anyways, I go to like show the film and it's like, you know, when it's go time, KJ is very intense as we all are. And uh, I go to present the film projector. doesn't work. It's broken. I didn't test it. He <laughs> loses his mind on me, loses his mind. You bet your ass from that day forward. I never didn't check anything five times. It was, it was like, a, a Kyle, it was like when I, you and you're in college. And uh, you're like a freshman and you go to, you know, whatever, you got your morning practice, you're tired as hell, you stay up till two in the morning. And then like you got to practice four hours later, but like people take naps and you can't take a nap because you're so paranoid all the time that you're just like on one. It's like <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, man. I, you should see my my assistants and the helpers here in Taiwan. They, they roll with 10 HDMI cords because one of our first film sessions ever, they forgot the HDMI. So now they've got like 10, 10 each because I did the same thing to them before. Like, don't fuck with my film session. I guess like the first thing that I wanted to start with is just kind of like maybe a little bit of an introduction of who you are. Yeah. So uh, um, live in Virginia in the States, obviously. Uh, got into player development about 10 years ago. Kind of just uh, some kids reached out because I played collegiately um, and uh, had an engineering job at the time. Same thing. Was making really good money right out of college and then basketball kind of became the path, um, just developed, kind of found a passion for it. Um, but, uh, but since then, it's been a long 10 years, been fortunate, Doug. It's obviously how, how you and I met, um, spent a lot of time kind of traveling around all over the U S a little bit around the world, running camps and things like that. And then, then fortunately in the past couple of years have had, had guys I've worked with extensively in their collegiate days with university of Virginia being right here, who are now, here are now in the league and then come back and spend their summers here. Uh, so it's a, it's a fun balance. Spend a lot of time working with pros in their off season, but then still get to work with the, you know, the 13 year old girls who are trying to make their JV team or whatever, which is, it's kind of a fun balance. Cause I still work like working with those grassroots kids who are trying to, trying to figure out what they want to be or basketball is their path or not. That's, I mean, that's who I was. Um, but then at the same time, spend your summers working with guys who are trying to get paid and trying to, get that second contract or become an all-star. So it's a, you know, it's a fun balance. And I, I, for me, I can't really see, I can't see myself wanting to focus on just one or the other because I enjoy, you know, both of them so immensely. No, man, that's cool. I, I what's, uh, I always joke about this. I say like from pros to Joe's KJ, I'm sure that you're the same. Like what's your, I guess your thought process or your philosophy of like how you train these people and like, uh, you know, like, they, like you say, a 13 year old versus a pro, like obviously what you do in the workout changes, but what, what is your kind of take on that? How does a workout differ in your eyes from a technical uh, standpoint and just, an, I don't know, I guess like an accountability standpoint. Yeah. I mean, and I mean, my philosophy is, I mean, once you become a professional, like what you do great, if it becomes exceptional, then that's how you get, get second contracts and things like that. And of course you're trying to you want to sharpen up your weaknesses and, th and all that, but I mean, you kind of are, you are who you are where when you have those younger kids, it's, it's more of a, a clay pot and you can, they can kind of, you can kind of really shape who they're going to become as a player. Um, and they may, they probably need footwork and shooting and ball handling and a little bit of everything. Um, but especially once you become a pro, your, your time is limited. You have to make sure you take care of your body, obviously still work extremely hard, but if somebody's going to, 90% of their shots are going to come from the three point line, which seems like that's everybody anymore. Probably don't need to spend a whole lot of time working on <laughs> their post moves or anything like that. Um, which again, for me, it makes it fun because you have such extreme. Some is so specialized and then some is, is of course more of a clay pot that you're working with, but either way, like it's, 
that you just said it, the, the accountability is everything. If you don't have kids or, or pros, men, women who want to work, you know, it's all worthless. Before Kyle got into coaching, Kyle was kind of like the OG trainer of Toronto. Like, Kyle, who were you working with back in the day, like in Toronto, before we first got into this stuff? Uh, you know, it was like 2000, it was 2007, uh, 2008 when I stopped playing. Well, I actually didn't really stop playing. I, I just came, I was in between jobs and, you know, everybody always wanted to work out because I always had a plan and I always had keys to a gym somewhere or whatever. Um, but I, but I, I started getting parents started paying me to work with their kids and things like that. And so I turned it into a business pretty quick, but you know, a lot of those Toronto kids, um, at that time, like the, the Andrew Wiggins class, Kevin Pangos, Andrew Wiggins, like that whole class, like those, those were the big names. But, you know, there was a lot of really good high school kids that, that went on to get Division One scholarships. I mean, at one point, we, we had worked with like 75 kids that ended up getting the scholarship. And, you know, it's a bit of a loose stat, you know, 75, not, not like we were in the gym every single day with 75, but 75 kind of came through the program and did some of our workouts and did things like that. Um, you know, like the best story that I can tell is I used to have these Sunday morning workouts, Wednesday night workouts in Toronto where we had like the big groups. Right. And then, but we, you know, we always did the individual stuff, but you know, a kid named, you know, Cassius Robertson always comes to mind. Cassius started working with me in the 10th grade. Uh, he couldn't get any playing time on his high school. He played with, you know, Wiggins and all those kids at Vaughn before Andrew went to, uh, you know, Huntington prep or wherever he went in the state. But but Cassius was like just came to every workout. His mom would drive him everywhere, like hour here, an hour there, wherever. Came to everything, and then by the time he was a senior, he couldn't get a scholarship. So I had worked with kids and some and some people at Canisius in Buffalo. You know, I drove Cassius to Canisius, ended up getting him. You know, a little bit of a workout, a tryout. He ends up getting a scholarship. By his senior year, he's playing in, at Missouri. You know, he was a grad transfer at Missouri, like 15 a game in the SEC. And now he's in Spain, ACB, like, you know, 12, 13 points a night, making really good money and just turned himself into a player. So, you know, we just kind of like what Damon said, like we, we about accountability and stuff it was like we offered the workouts and a lot of players came through. Um, but like very few really cared enough to like allow the workouts to make them better right like to allow the workouts to be a vehicle in the school he, he was one of them we, we, we worked with a lot of really good players like like that that were like that was where the, the real enjoyment came from was those kids that weren't great in high school right that that were like on the fringe of being good and they just trained really hard and followed the plan and um that's kind of how i got into coaching professionally was we had worked with so many kids that went from high school to, you know, D1 or to a, a good youth sports situation and then played pro that we felt like we were a pro. We felt like we were pro coaches because we had worked with so many pros and helped them get to that level. Like that's how I got into the coaching, right? Uh, it was like enough relationships through players to say, yeah, he helped me get better. Like uh, that was kind of like the process. Like when me and Kyle, when I met Kyle Damon and, um, Kyle was running a program called A Game Hoops at the time with his dad, Stu. I remember um, he had, I mean, I, I can't remember who exactly who was on that team, but I remember Pangos is on it. So I was at UBC at the time and like, we you know, we're grown men. I was like 22, 23 years old and we show up and like, this kid's got to be 15 years old. And we had a point guard at the time named Josh White, who was like the, the Canadian player of the year. Josh was really good. And we're like, it doesn't matter how good of a 15 year old you are. Like, I don't care. You can't compete against a 23 year old man. It doesn't matter. This guy cooked us, man. He absolutely <laughs> torched us. Like, this guy is a savant. I remember thinking at the time, yo, who is this kid? Like, this kid's an absolute stud, and sure enough. But anyways, Kyle worked with him for a long time. I guess, like, you know, Kyle, I'll let you touch on this, and Damon, maybe, like, when you find, like, a player like that, from, like, a skill development standpoint, or just working with the behind the scenes, like, what do you notice at a young age is kind of the driver, what, what makes these kids inherently different than, than somebody else. Cause if you look at a guy like Kevin, like, and I love to use him as an example because he, you know, he's not six, seven and can't hit his head on the rim. So what about the him or guys like him, you know, make, make, make him different. You know, I, I, I love talking about, like, I love this question. I love the answer. So I've been coaching pro now for 10 years. I played pro for a certain point in time and for about eight years before I started coaching, 
I trained a lot of pros. And the one thing that always came back to me and, you know, NBA guys that make big money, college player, you know, the one thing that always came back was routine. So the great ones, like there's good ones, like there's good players in the NBA making, you know, $30 million a year, but the great players, the guys that what I consider a great player is a guy who maxed out, right. He's just maxed out. Like he's as fast as his body will allow him to be. He is as athletic as his body will allow him to be. He is as tough as he possibly can be. Right. And sometimes those guys don't play in the NBA, right. They, they play at different levels just because of their circumstance or physical physicals or whatever the case may be. But, all of the great ones have a routine. Okay. And you can see it immediately. So I always do when I meet a new player, when I always do when I'm recruiting, recruiting is what's the first thing they do when they get in the gym. Okay. So Kevin Pangos, for example, I like, he gets in the gym, everyone's talking, putting, looking at their phones. Everyone's kind of walking around shooting, you know, jogging after the ball, this and that Kevin is sideline to sideline ball handling. Then he's on the skipping rope. Then he's, then he's stretching and then he's form shooting. Then he's off the dribble and then he's hitting his three. And then now by the time we say, okay, everybody come on in, let's get started. This guy's got like a good sweat going. His touch and timing is razor sharp. You know, his form is nice. He's, he's, he's ready to play and, and he's, he's mentally locked in. And I've seen it at every single level. And I have coached so many good players and they never have a routine. I've coached a few great players and they always have a routine. Like in how you can tell a guy has a routine is not by, you know, the first time you meet him, what does he do or what does he not do? That That's not how you tell. If you ask a guy on the phone what his routine is, he should be able to tell you like to a letter, to a minute, to a rep, what his pre-practice routine is, periodized. Okay, so preseason, I do it like this. In season, I do it like this. Postseason, I do it like this. You know, game day, I do it like this, blah, 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 blah. And it never, ever fails. Every time I'm around a guy that has a routine, he's just a killer. He's a dog. They're like cut from the exact same cloth. They really, really, really want to win, man. Like they're just locked in all the time. They're the same. Like it's like you're talking to the same guy. And then for me, you know, I've never been at work. I have never worked in the NBA. I've never been around a lot of these guys. I've been I've been able to be around some. But then you start reading the Kobe stories, you start reading, you know, the Ray Allen stories, you start reading the guys that are ultra consistent and had the 17 year careers and won some championships. It's all the same. Mm -hmm. For me, it just starts with routine because the guys that really have that 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 consistent routine, those are the guys that consistently play well. And there's so many guys at the highest levels I've watched. them. They just come in to just pick up a ball. They just kind of mess around a little bit. They start warming up a little bit. And then when you get into the details and the guts of a routine, I don't care about a routine for a week or a month. I'm talking six months to 10 months to four years to six years, like the same every day, right? Because uh, consistency adds, right? Like it compounds, right? Consistency compounds, like it, it builds and it builds and it builds. And the routine too this is the other part of the routine because, you know, I coach now, I lose four games in a row. I get, I get fired. My family doesn't eat. Right. So I'm, I'm looking for every little sliver of a detail that'll help me and help our guys win. The season is such an up and down battle, right? It's such a mental battle. Everybody goes through a bad time during the season. Every player, every coach, every water boy, every film guy has a bad week or whatever. It's an, it's inevitable. It's it's a guarantee. It is like tax. And the routine is what gets you through them. Like the shooters that are slumping, it's their routine that gets you through it. The coaches that lose three in a row, it's their consistent preparation and ability to stay positive and locked in or whatever that gets them through it. And I did, that's just, that's what it is for me, man. And like the way we train and our workouts and stuff, like they're designed to build a routine. And that's why I think like there's so many trainers that are helping players and helping the game. And there's so many trainers that are hurting the game because they're taking kids away from that number one key that we're discussing right now, which is like the ability to be self-motivated, right? Because it doesn't matter how many trainers you have during the summer, how, how hard you work, you know, how many fucking videos you have on YouTube or how many you know, on, on Instagram or whatever the case may be, all that shit is gone and you're alone out there in the fourth quarter. 
when you're dog tired and it's a four point game, five and a half minutes left and your coach is calling combination plays and you're going from man to zone and zone to man and you're being this and that and, and, and you know, it, your life depends on this game. You're alone. Like, it's just you and the work that you did. It doesn't matter if, you you know, what your teammates are doing for you. You still got to execute, right? It's five on five. Like, you're out there alone if you're not truly prepared and, and whatever. And it always comes back to routine for me, you know? And so, for me, man, it's all of that. I know I just went on a crazy long rant. But, you know, I live and die with – I tell our guys – this is what I tell our guys today. You know, we, we had long practice this morning, and we had another practice afternoon review and stuff going over things. And I just said – we are going to be as you, – you guys are a good team. I, I like what we're doing. I like I like our energy, a lot of stuff, et cetera, et cetera. But I said we're only as good as your individual habits. So if 10 of our 12 guys have great individual habits and are consistently pushing their routine and staying locked in, we'll be solid this year. Like, we'll be solid. But if we only got four out of the 12 or whatever, then we're going to struggle. And again, this goes back to those individual habits, right? Like it's so cliche. We are our habits on and off the court. Right? So that's my, that's my rant on, on, you know, player development. And the, the biggest thing is, is every time I'm, I, every time I talk to a player, he tells me he's been working out all summer. He tells me, um, I'm ready to go coach. I've been following your program. I've been working out. I got my trainer doing this and that. And then he shows up and he's, he's not ready. Like he's not ready. Right. And so, and so, you know, the, the big thing is self-motivation, having a routine and then making sure the workouts are just tougher than what you're going to face in the game. Right. And I just don't think a lot of people train like that at all. They don't, you know, it, it takes a long time to work. If you take, let me just, let me just finish this rant here. If you, if you take a combination move, take, take, let's just say we all have an hour in the gym. Right. We all have an hour in the gym and I'm coming off pick and roll full speed. I'm, I'm going floaters. I'm going mid range pull ups. I'm going threes because he went under. Then I'm going rejects, you know, because of the ice and, and whatever. Right. And I'm just working full speed, full speed, full speed. But you're working on the same kind of system, but you're just adding combos to the whole thing. Right. I bet you I get 30 percent more reps in the workout in that hour just because the actual physical time it takes to work on combination moves. So whenever I see all the combo stuff that I know you'll maybe do 1% of the time you actually touch a basketball, it makes me nervous, man, because how many reps has this guy really been getting? And, and then you can go obviously into the game reps, but always comes down to time, right? Like how, like, what did you get? What did you truly accomplish in that amount of time? And, and then it'll go back to your conditioning because that's like the number one thing. It doesn't matter how sharp you are, athletic you are, physical you are, how, how high your IQ is. Everything literally dies when you get tired, right? And that's why guys that have routines don't get tired. They're just the type of people that don't because they're, they're always, always, because they're routinized, because they trust their routine and, and they, they can't go without their routine, they're always in shape. Like they're always in shape. I have so many stories coaching the last 10 years of really, really good players, two ways in the G League, the whole nine coming in. I, I We signed a guy last year that signed a 10-day in the NBA the year before, and I'd never had a guy come in worse shape in my life. But you, were, you had a 10-day. That's why you're coming to play for me in Taiwan and not, you know, and didn't turn that 10-day into another one or another one or a two-way. That's yeah. why. Like it just yeah. never fails. It, yeah. Like it's just – it's just as true as the day is long people's ability to stay in shape and then what they do to stay in shape. Right. Anyways, man, that, that was my long rant. Sorry, Damon, you and I, you and I have never met. And then you just, it was no, like, no. you just sat through one of my, one of my yeah, okay. sessions. Man. You'll see, you'll see there. He, he's the best. To get no, you fired up. Yeah, what I about you? At all. I just want to hear you talk some more. <laughs> <laughs> Damon, what about you? I mean, no. obviously like being close to, and being an alumni of, uh, you know, University of Virginia men's basketball, and you kind of have the end with these guys, and you've been working with a lot of them. Like, what's like, I guess, the common theme that you see from these guys that, you know, come in maybe as like freak athletes, and then the guys that really start to last? Like, I know you've worked with Ty Jerome quite a bit. You look at Ty, like, from what I know about him, you obviously know him way better. There's no way that guy's the best athlete. Right. Like, what makes someone like that different to you? And I guess, I don't know, maybe just touch on that a little bit. 
Yeah, and I'm I'm I don't want to beat a dead horse with everything KJ was touching on. Just the routine, the routine, the routine is it's just everything. Um, but again, like the self accountability and the discipline of it all. I mean, UVA obviously had the the famous sixteen one loss to UMBC several years ago. Um, and first text I had from Ty Jerome the next day was like, I didn't do a good enough job last year. Um, he said, wherever you are, like I will drive wherever I need to go. It doesn't matter how far it is. It can be mornings. It can be night. Like we have to be in the gym more than we were the year before. Um, and we've been in the gym a lot, but just that level of, of self-reflection and that level of, Hey, it, it's on me, that internal locus of control. What can I do better? How can I be more disciplined? Where, especially now and KJ touched on it, it's so easy. Like you have, you have guys who are not working hard at all, who have, hundreds of thousands of followers or whatever, because of what their work looks like. I mean, we all know like kids, man, you got to be dogs and you got to be pit bulls. And I tell kids all the time now, like a lot of poodles out there, you got a lot of show dogs, but not a lot of dogs you want in a dog fight. And you know, you have to be that you have to be able to say like, I did, I wasn't good enough. I have to go harder. And I was going as hard as I can, but I got, I got to find a way to, to dig a little bit deeper. Like your shirt, man, I got to have a little bit more grit. Um, you know, kid, we have all these kids, kids, pros, whatever, who, like, man, they don't even know if they have a second win because they never exhaust their first one because when they get tired, they, they shut it down. They're never going to be in the best shape because they don't know what their best shape is. Um, but, but like guys like Ty and like, I mean, he came in whatever top 100 kid, but uh, anybody who talked to is he, is he athletic enough? Like, I mean, he's six, six and barely dunks. His vertical is, is horrible. His you know, the NBA shuttle times and all that were minimal but he's absolutely maximizing himself. He's never a guy. It's, it's never make 10 shots. It's makes, you know, make X amount in a row. It's have to be swishes. It has to be, it's things like that, that extra level of discipline maximizing when he is in the gym, KJ was touching on it. It's not mindless, worthless ball handling and wasting time. It's man, if you come off of a ball screen and bigs in drop and you're shooting a quick pull up, well then where can we get a second shot? Where can we get a third shot? How can we maximize the number of shot attempts within that hour as opposed to, Oh, we're going to drift to the corner, shoot a three, and then we're going to walk back to half court and do it again. Um, Really trying to maximize the, you know, the shot attempts, the work when we're in the gym, Um, because it is important. Obviously like the days of being in the gym for three and four hours are kind of done. Like people aren't doing that for better or for worse. So how can we maximize, maximize that time when we're there? Um, Mm -hmm. But again, again, KJ said, said it's so much better than I can with the routine, but then that just the self-awareness to know that, in the, the day, it is on you and talking about the love of the game, especially with with good players, with high level players. I feel like there are a lot of guys who love the game, but there are even more who especially now love the love that you get from the game. You have a highlight dunk and goes viral on Twitter or whatever. And it doesn't matter that you didn't work or what you've got that one highlight. And those guys who actually love the game, who are willing to sacrifice the early mornings, the late nights, the. Man, I feel like I'm going to throw up. I'm going to get up extra 100 extra shots. Those are the ones that make it. And and to you know to your point, like maybe that means you're a pro. Maybe you you shouldn't have been an NBA player, but you earned your way to that, like Ty Jerome. Or maybe it's maybe it's a kid who shouldn't have played college basketball, but they, you know, I've got a kid who's playing Division two at Tribeca Nazarene in Tennessee, and no business whatsoever playing college basketball. But I've been with him for five years. He shows up 30 minutes before literally every single workout, has a full stretching and ball handling routine. He's drenched in sweat. Then we get after it. And for him, like greatness maximizing his ceiling is he's going to school for free at the Division II level. And yeah. if he has a post collegiate career, who knows? Um, but again, like the, the great ones are the ones that, that find that way. They're, they're self aware, they're disciplined. And then, like KJ said, like they have a, they have a routine. You know, in 2017, I spent some time with – sorry, KJ. In 2017, I spent some time with, with Chris Brickley out in New York, and I got to see, you know, like I went from one week I'm working with a 13-year-old in Vancouver, B.C. The next week I'm on a private jet with Carmelo Anthony. I'm working out with Donovan Mitchell. I'm working out with CJ. And, like, I saw – I'm not going to name names because, like, this could go. But, like, yeah, I seen guys that were top five, you know, dudes – top five talents in the NBA. And then I'm looking at their personal habits and like, it's no surprise. Those dudes ain't in the league anymore. And I remember watching Donovan Mitchell and I honestly at the time, like, because I was working with Kyle and like, I was, I saw there was guys in, in like, we're coaching in the NBL Canada at the time. And there was guys in the league that were like, these guys are McDonald's all Americans and they're playing like lower level professional basketball, but they're freak talents, right? Like the Lenny cooks of the world. And then you look at someone I'm working with CJ or Donovan 
And those are like perfect examples. Like these guys came in and they were so hyper competitive, so hyper competitive in, in everything that they did. I remember we did this workout. It was one of Kevin Durant's first workouts back and like Chris would be passing the ball. I'm guarding these guys and every, every drill, you know, we go through like a sequence of shots and, um, uh, Kevin hadn't played in a bit. He was coming off the first year that they won the championship. And then where we go through his progression, five makes agent makes each, sorry. And, uh, CJ had been working out like a dog because he had to, and his habits were so great that he was sharp, like sharp as nails. Right. Well, he went through and he like, he torched Kevin Durant, he absolutely torched him. And instead of coming off the breaks, because I remember at the time, like I'm looking at Chris and I'm like, yo, like this is bad for business. Cause I'm literally guarding CJ. Like it's game seven of the NBA finals in a gym in, in up uh, the Upper East Side of New York. And I'm like, with the, uh, Kevin Durant, I'm like back away from him, this guy as far as possible. Mind you, his reach is so long. I was like 15 feet away and he still hit me because his length is insane. But I remember I look at CJ and the telltale sign about him was I was like, yo, he knew the deal. He knew that like, you know, the NBA superstars of the world, you can't really deal with those guys the same way. And it comes down to coachability. Like now Kevin Durant's a freak athlete, but maybe someone who's not the same as uh, Kevin Durant, like the, any sort of tweak in your mentality or like your work ethic will, will throw your career off track. And I'm, I look at CJ, I didn't have to say it. I'm like, dude, I'm a guard. You like it's game seven, the NBA finals, because at the time I'm like, this is bad for business, man. He's still like, he loved it. And that like element of hyper, hyper competitiveness and just like self-awareness, but also like grounded in humility. It's like a massive driver too. like those guys where, you know, it just comes down, like you said, love of the game and love of the process. And it's so like cheesy, but I don't know. It is what it is. What, um, that was really good. I think Kyle, I guess I know it's late there for you and I don't want to keep you up too long, but I think, what do you think is just kind of like the state of the game today? And like, what advice both of you guys, I suppose, would you give like a young player as they navigate this stuff? Because it is a very convoluted world these days. Like, you know, I think the access to sport and, and uh, access to higher level training is great, but to what end? Like it's kind of going so far the other way that people now, because it's a business are messing with these kids perception of what's real and what's not. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough to give advice, right? Cause everything is so circumstantial, you know, like you can't just say work hard because you know, it's not fair, man. The game, the game's not fair. Life, life's not fair. I know a lot of kids that work their tails off and, 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 you know, they've never, never, ne never have, they haven't necessarily reaped the benefit of it. And then some other kids that don't work that hard and good things happen to them. Right. So it's hard. It's hard to specifically, for me, it's always been difficult to give advice to young kids. My, my whole, my whole thing is, is the routine. Like my whole thing is fall in love with the training and the process because no matter what happens, you'll become a better human being. Like you'll become a better person. Like if you're like, so we, we have our guys write everything down at night, right? What went well today? What didn't go well? Why? Let's eliminate what didn't go well. Let's build our schedule for tomorrow off of what didn't go well and what did go well. And, and let's attack that. And I just think I, I, I started doing that in the ninth, 10th grade, and it was really good for me. And I just think it's a great way to live. And we help help kids build you know, some, some discipline and, and some structure. And then within that, when you fall in love with the process, like, you know, I, I think I told you, I know I told all our teams in Canada all the time when I was playing overseas, you know, an old German veteran player once told me I was complaining about in my first year. I was fucking complaining about everything all the time. He told me, shut up. And he said, he said, young fella, this thing is 75, 25, man, 75 suffering, failure, shit you know, crying yourself to sleep, 25% success. He's like, we all, we're all out here for that 25%, man. So when you have these bad days and when, you, you know, when, when you hit the grind and it's, it's hard, you know, we, you got to accept it because it's part of getting to that, that 25. Right. So I've all, I, that stuck with me. I was about 24 years old when I heard that. I mean, I, I don't, I don't think I've ever heard anything that rang more true to me as a person at the time. Cause I remember sitting there on the bus, we were coming back from a, from a road game and, and uh, we had a low budget team in Italy in the first league. And every, we, we took the bus everywhere and other teams are flying. And, and um, I remember being on that bus being like, yeah, man, my whole basketball career is pretty accurate. 75, 25, maybe even 80, 20, you know, uh, failure and suffering, you know. Um, and so I've always approached it that way. And I think when kids, when you talk to kids and you're real with kids and kids really understand it, this really is hard. 
but it's a good thing that it's hard. It's a good thing that you get cut from teams. It's a good thing that you fail. As long as you, again, you build that healthy routine to go back at it, get up and attack it. Uh, good, only good things can happen. And and I think D- Damon's example of his player playing D2, going to school for free because he's maxed out. I think I love that, man. Like that's, that's, you know, I think I look at coaching that way, whether I get a chance or not to ever coach in the NBA or Euro league or whatever, I know I'm maxing out every day, studying, trying to be better with relationships, trying to be better with the game, trying to be better with every aspect of the game. And I think that's the right way to go about it. And um, it's 80, 20, 75, 25 suffering. But if these kids understand that and they learn to attack that and actually find a way to enjoy that, only good things will happen. I think the state of the game right now is the opposite right? It's only the 20% that you see. It's only the 20% that's talked about. And then all of a sudden, within that 80% of the suffering, that's pretty natural in this process, right? Because it's really hard to be elite, right? Within the 80%, I'm going to transfer. No, it's the coach's fault. You know, my my favorite line in all of basketball, right? Like, is ever since I started coaching, coaches tripping, man. It's coaches tripping. (laughs) It's my favorite. It's my favorite because and, I, and I've seen it so many times, especially when you really are coaching and you're, you're evaluating your seasons and you're breaking things down, what went well, what didn't go well. It always comes down to some relationship somewhere with somebody, right? And so many kids, and I was, I was like that for a while as a player. It's just like not my fault, it's his fault, or it's not my fault, it's the circumstance, right? So finding a way to teach these kids to, be, to understand that the 80% is natural, that that 75% of the suffering and failure is natural. How do we get through it? versus just transferring right and i i can speak on that i trans i transferred schools you know I, I was playing division one basketball and i transferred after my second year and i it's legitimately to this day my number one and only true regret in all of my basketball as a player and, and as a coach i regret not staying and figuring out a way to accept my situation and and, and attack it and conquer it i hate that i didn't stay and do that. I mean, I went on to have success as a player, relative success, but I hate that I didn't stay and do that. And when you look at the game now, it, I don't care that so many people are transferring. Again, everything is circumstantial. I just hate that so many people are quick to transfer. And it starts in high school, AAU, you know, I'm not playing, so I'm going on this team. Coach is tripping, so I'm going over here. Ah, oh, the system, man, the system is not for me. I, the system's not for me. You know, you know, whatever the case may be, I'm going over here. Same thing as a pro, right? Like, you know, um, you you look at a lot of pros when we recruit. It's like, okay, this guy's played all over Europe. He's played all these places, but he's never been brought back to the same team. Yeah, so you yeah. get on the phone with him. You know, you get on the phone with him and you say, hey, how come no one's ever – you've been playing eight years, good numbers, but how come no one's ever really brought you back? Oh, man, you know, it's just been – I didn't like this coach here and I didn't like that coach there. And, you know, this, this shit didn't work out because I didn't like the food in this country and, you know – it's always stuff like that, right? So when, yeah. when I think that 75 or 80 gets accepted and people want to attack it, I think good things will happen. And and too many times it's the reverse, right? People aren't, they're not willing to go through the, the suffering and, and, and the uh, failure. 